Hi everyone, we're going to do a quick introduction of ourselves before we get started. Um, thank you all for coming. I know this is uh, almost end of the sessions for all of you, so it's really good to see all of you. Uh, my name is Anandi. Uh, I am uh, in Amazon and I'm part of the Open Source Open Search project. I'll turn it over to Pallavi. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Pallavi Priyadarshini, and I lead uh, the engineering for search and security at OpenSearch. Hello. Hi. My name is Anirudh Jadhav. I'm engineering lead for the dashboards, UI components on OpenSearch, and the query engineering platforms and powering observability. Great. OK. So we'll get started. So we're going to, the three of us, we're going to cover multiple areas around OpenSearch. And then in the end, if we have time, we'll do a Q&A. OK, so let's get started. Op so how many of you know what open search is? Wow. That's incredible. OK, I was actually prepared to explain what open search is. Well, I'll just give a quick um, a summary. Um, open search is a, a project which was started about in early 2021. And we are now part of the Open Search Software Foundation under Linux Foundation. Um, we just announced it a couple of months ago. And uh, just judging from this audience, it's a, you know, a lot of people know what Open Search is. And we have a very vibrant community. And we have also a, a vibrant governing uh, board with members. I have members from NetApp. Uh, Brian here and Jonah, who is in our uh, technical steering committee as well. And so um, the technical steering committee for Open Search has a diverse set of stakeholders across a variety of companies. So it's a vibrant open source project. And uh, what is it? At a high level, it has, it's a powerful distributed search engine, and it has a rich and insightful visualization tools, toolkit and a, and a dashboards. And we also have an ingestion system called the Data Prepper. And from a use case perspective, Open Search has been, is, is widely used across search observability and search analytics. And we'll go a lot of, into detail in, uh, on observability. Uh, but one additional thing which is, you know, emerging is open search has become a popular vector database and it has become the foundation for building the generative AI apps, uh, both for observability, security analytics and for core search. And uh, we also have rich integrations with toolkits across a, a variety of open source systems, including Langchain, Open Telemetry, Agar, and more. And we'll dive into a little bit of the detail in the uh, subsequent slides. Now, with that quick intro, I'm going to turn it over to Pallavi, who's going to talk about the innovations we're doing in the search engine. Thanks, Anandi. So this slide kind of covers the major areas of innovation in the last couple of years. These are just examples. So we established our open search, established its own identity after the fork uh, in late 2021. So in 2022 onwards, obviously areas like performance, scale, stability, uh, they were top of mind for us. We invented quite a few things over there. But we also accelerated on some of the features, right? And these are a few examples. Um, so we unveil support for neural search, hybrid search, which allows you to do you know, text and vector search together. Um, and then uh, we also rolled out capabilities for uh, creating conversational experiences with open search. There are native integrations done uh, to serve as a better analytics engine, like the integrations with Prometheus and the Query Federation via Spark, which Ani will talk about in detail. Uh, then there are more areas such as dashboards, which we have overhauled uh, off late, which also Ani will show you in, the, in his own demo. 
But what I really want to highlight in this slide is through our innovation journey, we are partnering with our community, right? It's, the innovation is really being driven by the community of maintainers. And these are a few examples where the features were done by the maintainers. So for example, Intel contributed a Z standard compression, which is a more efficient storage algorithm and helps stay saving cost. Arin more recently contributed a RAG processor for open search. Ivan was uh, instrumental in helping out on concurrent segment search that allows you to do fast searches for large workloads. Now, going forward, we have laid out a very clear roadmap in open source with uh, well-established themes. And largely, these are the areas along which the community is innovating. And today, for the purpose of this session, we'll focus on search and obviously observability. So now delving a little bit into search, open search is fundamentally a search engine. And search is the heart of what all the use cases we power, right? So, you know, you can use search for search-focused use cases, and these are a few examples. You can have an e-commerce site, document portal for searches, or you can build a recommendation engine. Or even for some of the observability uh, use cases where you're really mining large amounts of uh, logs, traces, metrics, you are working with different search algorithms under the covers, right? So it is very important for the future of open search to innovate in the core search engine. And that's what I'm going to talk a little about. So performance is a big area. Through all the use cases we power, right? Um, performance at scale is very important. Open search is a general purpose search and analytics platform. And we have users and customers who use open search for petabytes of data, right? So we want to make sure that we run queries, we run different algorithms very fast, right? And you can do more with less. So with that, now we wanted to focus on performance, but that also means we needed good ways to measure the performance. So that's where the role of benchmarks come in. And we've recently established open search benchmark and everything I'm talking out here is open source is available on our GitHub page. We've established open search benchmark as a scalable benchmarking tool. Um, and we really want performance to be a transparent area of focus for the open source community. And these are a few links. We've added new workloads, and the one workload that I want to point to is the recent addition of the Big Five workload. Big Five workload captures 40 plus query operations that are representative of search and observability use cases, right? And uh, they're grouped into different categories, text queries, sorting, term aggregation, range queries, date histograms. So this is an example of what is available on our GitHub benchmarking page. There are different workloads we run nightly, and there's a team that actually monitors the performance. So the check-ins that are happening, the builds we are doing, the releases we are doing, we want to make sure that we keep improving on performance, right? So as I said, like there's a focused effort to improving the search engine, the core search engine performance. This is an example of the accelerations we have done of late. So Open Search 2.17, which was released about, a, about three months ago, it had a 6.5, a factor of 6.5 times faster over Open Search 1.3 that was released in first half of 2023. And the optimizations and some of the strategic features targeted towards performance improvements are being done across the board. And the downward trend is what we want. We are measuring the latencies uh, pretty much like every release, every build. 
<clears throat> Along with benchmarks, we have customers and users who use us in many different ways. So we want to make sure that with large amount of data and different use cases, we are able to still keep the same bar. We want to keep improving on performance. So there are a lot of features that are done that will help when you're running large workloads with open search. And as an example, concurrent segment search or tiered caching, when you have large amounts of data, you can spill data to your disk. And there are other examples as well. So it's not just about you know, doing things fast, but for us, it is about doing things fast at scale. And as an extension to the current initiatives around performance, we're also building a next generation query engine that has a sophisticated query planner at the search coordinator nodes, which can take some real-time decisions on query execution plans, and which will be able to do query rewrites to make it faster, et cetera. Now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ani, who's going to talk about how do we use this engine for powering different use cases. Thanks, Valavi. Can you guys hear me? Cool, thanks. Uh, let's start with like the stack as a whole, and then talk about the use cases of data exploration before jumping into observability. Uh, some of the key things available as part of open search the platform are the capabilities which are the core engine that Pallavi talked about. On the left-hand side, you see a data prepper, which is an ingestion pipeline. This is an OTLP compliant ingestion pipeline. It has simple blueprints, which you don't need to mess around too much with configurations. You have it send data from OTLP, from sources, from pipelines like Kafka, and you can move this with simple blueprints into open search and optimized open search storage. You can fork it into open search and S3 if required and object stores. And these are like simple operations which are easy to perform. You don't have to mess with configurations here. So that's the ingestion part of getting data in. The data paper makes it simple. Once you have data in open search, you can store it as indices. Generally, they're structured as log indices, time series indices. It's a very generic concept of an index in open search. But for tracing in particular, we support indexing formats like Jaeger, open telemetry indexing formats. So we know when these are traces, and we can pick them up and do more with them without you having to define them. We can pre-process tracing into maps, trace groups, and do analytics on it at ingestion time. So some of the analytics can be leveraged at read time. We can offset the data that is not in open search that should be used for analytics by adding data sources. We'll talk more about data sources in detail in a few, but for now we have Prometheus, you can have objects chose like S3 connected into open search. Now that you have all this ingestion and data available at, in the engine, how do you use it? Uh, the primary mechanism to use it, you could use REST APIs and APIs are always available. Uh, we'll look at dashboards. Dashboards is our UI framework how it can be used to build applications, how it can be used to build workflows, tooling, and hold like vertical segments on top of it. And we'll talk more about when you have the data, when you have these workflows, how do you interact with it? The language part of it becomes more crucial now. How are you conversing with it? Or how do you make what you want in your head appear on your screen? So for that, I think let's cover the next topic purely as how do you interact with data in open source? So natively, the engine, the core, supports Lucene and DQL as its query languages. These are generally termed as filtering languages. They allow you to negate things in your data. You have a large corpus, and you're reducing it, reducing it until you find what you need, and you're looking through stuff. That's the typical way of filtering stuff in open source. Second operation is a query. Everybody's familiar with SQL. It's generally when you think about group buys, aggregations, you are querying and structuring data before and then using it after the fact to just execute it once. That's like a one-time query operation by definition. Well, observability is a bit different. In observability, you never know what you want. You want to investigate. So when you investigate, discover, and think about like what is the next operation, the next operation, one thing that comes to mind is Unix all of a sudden, and the pipes over here. So that's why pipe processing language is one of the key human interactions that we are proposing on the dashboards and the UI tier of open search, which can help you do these investigative workflows for observability. 
as part of the pi processing language, there's a whole syntax of commands that we have come up with. Uh, these are getting constantly added and appended by. Uh, what I have over here is commands grouped by like grokking commands, which can synthetically create data at runtime with fields. You can have patterns to understand how does a large corpus of data, maybe like two million records, distill into 20 or 30 key patterns that you can investigate. Maybe there's an outlier in a login, and that login outlier is the tail end of your millionth record, which will never come up in search. Some of these can be surfaced very easily with patterns. We have rename, search, sort, Stats is a very important command, and it's very simple when you look at it, but it can get really complex, and you can do too many things with it. You have x, y, z, and z is the bucketing parameter. And you can have any dimensions in x or y, and you can build pivot tables over here. And you can slice and dice the pivot tables or invert them by any field. These things become very important when you're investigating stuff on the fly. Going ahead, uh, let's jump into a demo where we see the interfaces, the workflows we spoke about, and try some commands out for ourselves. So as we jump into open search, uh, this is a newer visual interface that Pali was talking about. We've completely overhauled how visually open search looked. It used to be like very oldish, 10-year-old, blocky, big old thing. Now it's more contained into a dense UI. It's also structured as vertical workflows, like what is observability, what is security, search, and what are these workflows going to use? How would they tailor the navigation and the product side of it? Let's jump into the primary tool. Once you land in any of these workspaces, I'm just gonna jump over here and see. Uh, once you land in any of these workspaces, you come up at a starting point, and the main tool you use is Discover. Discover is your window into open search. This is how you interact with your data. This is where you explore your data. Uh, this is primarily meant for time series, can be used for everything. When you come and discover, you're looking at a top panel with save and search and new operations, or time filter. Left-hand side goes with columns of data on the query. When you're interacting with your data, you have some quick filters and data sets appearing and you will have access to remote data sources, local indices, indices from remote clusters. This is how you generally get into data and then you query it. The first query we'll see is fairly simple. You have source equal to my logs index and on the logs data set, I'm just doing response code is X uh, equal to 503 or 404. Once you execute this query, uh, this is generally what will you see as input, uh, as our output over here, which you can slice and dice and add columns and evaluate. Let's go to a bit more complex queries. Second query we'll see over here is uh, adding fields plus a where clause. And now if you have any response codes, generally there are too many errors. You want to like distill them into like remove the duplicates. Give me like some things that matter. So you have a dedupe command for duplicating stuff. Post duplication, you would be looking at like which are the IPs where these error messages are coming from, which are the hosts these guys are coming from. So you can do the count, and you can do the count with some of bytes as how much payload is coming. You want to investigate if these queries have been failing or these errors have been failing because of large payloads or some errors and responses. Uh, here I'll just go through some examples of commands in general. Uh, you could add sorting. Evaluation commands can take any fields above and do arbitrary arithmetic on it to generate new fields on the fly. As you see, the number of commands and the complexity of the queries can slowly become more and more to a point where this is not humanly easy to do. You can always learn it, but uh, the question comes in like, why do you have to learn something nowadays that you have AI and models allowed? So the open search platform allows and enables the AI toolkit. The AI toolkit can be supplemented with your own custom models or remote models. Once you manage your models, all the tools in open search can start working with those defined models. What we're seeing over here is an example. The query over here I'm running is, show me the top five URIs for the largest response size. When I execute this query, it will return a result to me. Uh, this result is sum of bytes, 
represented as total bytes, sorted by the URL, sorted by negative minus sort on the bytes, and it's giving me the top five. Uh, I could have written this query, but it would have, have taken me some time. It's one of the more simpler queries. You can start thinking about like, calculate the total bytes transferred for events with the success, and then group by the event name. Like I could definitely write this query, but the natural way for me is to always think about something. You just write what you think about, the queries are generated. This uh, ability to just introduce and plug and play models in your primary experiences and giving them in the main query experience gives you that one leg up into writing queries. This is one of the key parts, even though the query language is more important and takes the front seat. One more query to look at uh, is over here. Total number of bytes transferred. Let's do a new query over here. Let's just run something. Let's see uh, one of the simpler things. Are there any errors in my logs, for example? This piece will generate. Let me refresh this page. taking some time to generate a summary over here. Let me move ahead and come back to this. So the uh, query, the part of the query engine was primarily until now that we saw used to make queries to open search and operating on data in open search. As part of observability use cases per se, we have data outside of open search sitting majorly in metrics for Prometheus. And there's a lot of data we have in S3 sometimes. We do use a lot of cold storage. Everybody doesn't put all their observability logs into like one system. We always like keep on sharding things out. So this is where the concept of data sources come in. Data sources allow you to connect to a data source which is remote to the cluster. As you see a cluster, you can see remote connections show up. These can be remote open searches. Or you can see remote connections to a S3 bucket and you can operate on and use the same query languages that you are familiar with on open search on S3. This is how a configured S3 UI looks like. Uh, this is a query running on an S3 data source. Uh, this is the same pipe processing language. You don't need to learn anything new. Uh, the same language, the same semantics are carried forward. Now, before we jump into more in this demo, let's think about why we do have to do this, how this works, and then run a demo. So the primary use case of choice over here is operating over high volume, low cost use cases. Example, network logs, firewall logs. You don't generally see them every day, but you do want them when things go bad. And you're okay sometimes to have low latency, high latency access to them, but it still needs to be at an extremely low cost. Uh, this use case is well served with uh, Spark. So under the hood, Open Search has an integration with Apache Spark. Uh, we integrate at the Spark Catalyst layer. The query engine in Spark uses Open Search as its acceleration engine. For example, if you are using MySQL and you create one table and the table grows bigger and bigger and you run a query, it becomes slower and slower. So the first thing you do is create secondary indices. You create like a covered index, a skipping index, and you do these acceleration strategies. That's the exact same system we have implemented inside Spark Catalyst. So if you're using open search or not, as long as you're using pure Spark and running a query, you can use open search as a sidecar acceleration engine. The way it works is you do a create materialized view, a create covered index, or a create skipping index. Those data sets are kept, moved from Spark and S3 into open search. And next time when you run a query, these queries see which predicates or which parameters are used which of them are hot, which of them are cold, and the acceleration over here that we have seen is generally 90% or more. It really matters on how you model your data sets. For example, if you're doing a network query and you have host name as a key parameter, IP as a key parameter, use host name as a covered index, IP as a bloom filter index, run a query on host name and IP where clauses, you can run through like petabytes of data fairly quickly. 
So this is the core framework behind everything. But as a user of open search, when you saw the demos I was running, you never saw Spark. And I think that's what we want to stress on. The user experience should be querying data, getting to your data. So you just select your data set, select S3 connection, user data set, and you jump back straight into this interface, which will leave all the complexities of Spark away, have the same language, same capabilities implemented in Spark and open search work universally. There's another complex query I'll run. Uh, this is just status where uh, there are a few more queries, but in the interest of time, I'll go through one more common question that comes on. Everybody whom we talk to with the new language we have created, they're like, why not SQL? <laughs> so we also have SQL. We have three languages totally working on open source today. Uh, on remote data sources, we only support SQL and PPL. On data sources which are open source specific, we support SQL, PPL, and the native Lucene and DSL. So as you see, the query that is run over here has full power of the SQL grammar. But what SQL still misses is what we add on. SQL still misses full text search capabilities, match capabilities, fuzzy capabilities. That is where open search has its power. So they can marry these capabilities together now in a very meaningful way. Going ahead, once you have the query interfaces, ability to talk to your data, the next thing that comes up is visualizations. And every time I come up with a dashboarding use case, the thing that is like every customer starts using something and seeing the data, but every time a user is like, I want to set up a visualization or dashboard, they'll take months. Sometimes like literally months to set up all the dashboards and go through the pain of setting everything up. That's where integrations come in. With integrations, there is a catalog repo this repo defines all integrations that can be community contributed. You can upload integrations on the fly. They appear as tiles over here. These integrations provide dashboards, visualizations. Uh, all the assets are collected over here. They could have, going forward, we're adding alert configurations, anomaly configurations. Anything you need to do with a data set in open search as a configuration can be unified and collected by community contributions, which become a single whole, easy one-step process to use. Once you start using integrations, this is a dashboarding framework in open search. It can plot pretty dashboards. You have the full power of libraries that can plot visualizations, which are as simple as bar and line, but do scatter plots and complex uh, psi or map visualizations. These are some of the observability metrics and dashboards being visualized. Uh, I'm just glossing over some of the capabilities of the visual framework. But you can go deeper into these workflows, uh, do drill downs, clicks, and evaluate how workflows can be stitched together. Lastly, we'll spend some time in the core observability workflows in here. The observability part of the workspace that we are in is tailored particularly with traces, metrics, services, alerting, anomaly. So you're not bogged down with other auxiliary features that you may be like generally into when you're using an open source product. Uh, the tailored experience you can change on your own. This is fully customizable. Uh, what we go through now is traces and services. If you're ingesting data from Data Prepper or Jaeger or a custom source that you have defined, all of these choices will have access to a services chart, which shows duration, error rate, all the red metrics, a graph being plotted. On the graph, any node you click on should show service details. The service details will run you through what is this service doing? What has it been doing over the last five minutes? How is the throughput trend for the last 24 hours as compared to the five minutes? Generally, these simple things are the most important things you want to look at up front. The latency trends going up and down. You can see the service map and cover it by error trends, request rate, or duration. Dependency metrics and how they are doing, dependency services and how they are doing over here. Let me go with more than five minutes of data in this case. Let's say this week. View service details. I see more spans in here. You click on some span information. You see more details about that exact span and where it is coming from. 
And because the logs and metrics and traces are in the same system, uh, we can jump into associated traces from here. It goes you into the logging mode where it will show you which trace IDs are available from that particular jump point. It will show you the traces around it. Some of the newer features we are trying to come up is more customer-defined correlations. Everybody's use case and data is different. They will define and map correlations differently. So the focus of taking the core engine, supporting the core engine with use cases of remote data sources, infrequently used data sources, tying that with observability workflows like traces and metrics. I think that's the whole journey that we're taking towards and how we want to evolve open search observability and the query capabilities together from a use case standpoint. We have a bit about four minutes in here. Let me know if you guys have questions. Uh, hi. Uh, let's say I'm an open telemetry user. I have an app uh, that is instrumented with open telemetry. Maybe I have an open telemetry collector. I want to send data to open search. Uh, uh, what's the recommended way? How do I do this? So the recommended way, the easiest way, is going to be send OTLP data into Data Prepper, which will make sure the service maps, traces, logs around it will be cleanly struck without any configuration. There are other options. You could use Jaeger to send directly into open search. Jaeger indices are fully supported and they automatically get picked up. So Jaeger exporters work out of the box. Open telemetry exporters also work, but they need some configuration on your end. Those are detailed out. So if I, uh, if I spin up and manage the open search in AWS, do I, does it come with data prepper? Uh, data prepper is its own service. I think you can bring it as open search ingestion service. Okay, thanks. So which which of you work at AWS? All of us. All of you. All of you. Okay, great. So, in terms of large data sets on S3, do you see the potential for some extreme ballooning in pricing on like get requests with S3, or how does that work? So, generally, when you are working with S3 over here, we don't directly access S3 with every single query. S3. Uh, nobody really accesses it directly and gets things. You model it as a table, okay. or you model it as a structure that you are going to use. So we have an open search table format, or you use GDC or Hive. In these table formats, that's where most of our queries operate. So the open search table format and Hive GDC is what we use. Now behind that are supports are formats like Iceberg that you can opt in, and anything that you opt in underneath this is automatically supported by Spark, and our accelerations work on top of it. Okay. So whenever you are making any large queries, for example, the queries that I was running for the test data set, I, we used around one gigabyte of data zipped. When exploded out, it's around like one terabyte. And this scans happens in under a minute. Okay. And that is completely dependent on your Spark node how many executors and drivers you want to throw at it. Mm -hmm. So fully configurable, but you don't need to manage S3 at the low level. That's okay. the point. Awesome, thank you. But the, the, it's powered by the Spark engine and the work you know, we did in the SQL PPL plugin. So it's a combination of that, which is all in open source, by the way. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the latest version that's available in the AWS hosted open search is 2.17. Um, so that, it looks like these features that you're demoing right now are more like 2.18. Do you have any timeline on when it might be available so, in the AWS version? Yeah, you can take that. Okay, I can take it. I can take it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, just to answer. So, 217 is yet to be available on AWS Manager. It just came out it yesterday. Is, yeah, yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> um, and a lot of the things which uh, he demoed is actually already there. To, in the open source 217 was three months ago, so it's already there. And we also demoed uh, the Future Playground, which is currently available. And we recently released a modern open search visualization experience, which is also available. We was generally available last week, I think. 
Um, you want to talk more yeah. about that? Yeah. So um, what we're calling the next gen Amazon uh, open search UI that became available last week. So some of the modern look and feel, some of the enhancements have come into the open search UI, the next gen open search, which, which is its own release, right? It's not really tied to the managed server. It's, a, it's serverless dashboards, meaning you can have you know, one installation and you can have multiple um, clusters or collections. And this is what Ani was showing, the multi-data source experience. And it has version decoupling, like it, it is its own offering, cloud native, serverless. So some of the dashboard improvements have come in there first, right? as an offering, right? So I'm not exactly sure which particular thing you're looking at, but so it's a mix of things. So I can quickly add to that. Yeah. I can quickly add to this. Everything is available in open source since the last three or four versions, but everything is under a flag, so we don't like jerk anybody on like changes going on, but everything is open source under flags. You enable the right flags, you'll get the same experience. Yeah. What you're running here is open source yeah. version of it. And also from a managed service, if you actually, uh, we, 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 217 is already there, and we have this new navigation experience. If you search for open search modern experiences, uh, we can send you a link as well. You'll actually see how to get connected. There is a link to how to get connected. But we, we can easily help you with that as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the last thing I'll plug into it is we do everything in open source, and and then we take that and we release it, and the, it just maybe some knobs and stuff we have to tune, but all of this is demo today is available. Okay, so. uh, and just quick follow up that specifically the um, the AI assistant is something that would be really helpful for my team. We've got like a yeah. bunch of. Um, people who go into open search to look for logs but don't really know how to write the query language yes. and that kind of yes. stuff. So I have to spend a lot of my day answering questions about that kind of thing. Um, do you know if that is going to be available in GovCloud? Is something I'm interested in. GovCloud. It's. I don't. I. I think it's. I don't think we have a timeline on GovCloud. We, but we. But it's. AI Assistant has been available since 2.13. So if 2.13 is in GovCloud, we should be okay. Yeah, so we should be there. Okay. And you should be, the only thing is you have to connect it through this new uh, modern visualization system to a 2.13 domain. Um, but like I said, you can contact us and we can help you yeah. with that. Yeah. Cool. Someone else was asking. You can go ahead, give me the mic. Just uh, wondering if um, any performance improvements um, are planned for spatial data types, and also, um, you know, if any new visualizations um, are coming in, um, you know, into dashboards that are, you know, spatial related. So, so I think, uh, you know, when we talk about performance improvements, it is really across the board, like different. Features are doing their own as well. So geospatial, I, it is the geospatial data types you're referring to, right? Yes. So nothing comes to the top of my mind that is planned. So I'm, you know, we have a team that's looking at it, right? And if there is anything special that we let you know. But visualization, if you've tried, like the experience maps, have you tried the most recent experience? Yes. Okay. So I believe like the visualization, it, it is, you know, significantly better than what, I don't know, you know, compared to the older versions. Um, but yeah, the look and feel has improved, uh, you know, like even when we did this whole open search, uh, the next gen open search UI, um, that included the geospatial and the maps experience as well. So, you know, the navigation, all that has gone in. Performance, I need to check because I <coughs> think we were looking at a bottleneck per se. But was there anything on, on your mind? Like, have you seen something there that uh, triggers this question? Um, not really. Um, it's just um, um, uh, searches in um, like large complex polygons, you know, the, the, the uh, performance can definitely be um, 
better. I see. I see. So I think we'll get back to you. Uh, I, b the reason I'm uh, not giving a definitive answer is we have not run benchmarks with those, uh, you know, special data types, the, the geocode data types, right? Uh, but there are many other complex data types that we know, like that are included in our men benchmark, but this is a good follow-up for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank everyone. You. Okay.